Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the presidential address of the 132nd annual meeting of the American Historical Association. I'm Mary Beth Norton, I'm president-elect, and it's my pleasure to introduce Tywar Stovall, the 2017 American Historical Association president. Now, the booklet that everyone received, or you should have received it when you came in the door, has a detailed biography of him written by one of his former students, Michael Van. I'm certain of two things, because you're all historians, and you're not students, or most of you aren't. You will read those. <laughs> and since you're eager to hear his presidential address with its provocative and enticing title, you didn't come here to listen to me. So I'll make this introduction brief. Now I should tell you that I emailed Tyler to ask him if he wanted me to say anything specific in my introduction, and he replied modestly something along the lines of, just don't say I'm a superhero. <laughs> now you'll have to read the biography of him in the booklet to understand that reference. Now Tyler was born in Ohio. I'm happy to say we're both Midwesterners. We have one Midwestern president after another Midwestern president. I was born in Michigan. Um, he went east to Harvard as an undergraduate. He returned to the Midwest, to Wisconsin for his graduate work, and ever since he's been based in Northern California, alternating between UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz. Some years ago, he ventured over to the dark side, as he wrote in his November essay in Perspectives on History, becoming that dreaded university creature from the de deep, a dean. Though I'm sure all of us would be delighted to have him as our dean. I know I would be. As everyone here already knows, he's a distinguished historian of modern France, and indeed he is a key advocate of the ex an expansive definition of French history, especially in recent years as he has begun to place France in an explicitly transnational frame. Although he celebrates the <coughs> importance of France's tradition of what he terms Republican universalism, he is not uncritical of that tradition. He started as a labor and working class historian with a decidedly socialist bent, and he retains that general outlook to this day. He is also engaged in gendered analyses in both articles and books, as I discovered when I read his work for the first time this past year. As an African-American, uh, African he has brought to his scholarship a unique outsider's perspective on 20th century society and culture in France. He is not only that rare American who resisted becoming an unabashed, admiring Francophile when he first encountered Paris. He is someone who, as a person of color, resisted the myth of France's purported colorblindness. That perspective has read him in recent years and continues to lead him in scholarly works in progress described in the biography away from metropolitan France and into France's colonial empire. Accordingly, it's entirely appropriate that the major theme of this convention is race, race, ethnicity, and nationalism in global perspective. Now, Tyler and I had never met before we began to work together this year as president and president-elect. We have successfully collaborated with Jim Grossman and other members of the council on the production of AHA statements on President Trump's travel ban and on the Confederate monuments controversy that erupted this past summer, particularly after the tragic events in Charlottesville. In the past few weeks and at this convention, that collaboration has continued as we start to revise the AHA statement and procedures dealing with sexual harassment. I have found our relationship to be an important positive component of my term as president-elect. He has set a high standard for me and for my successor, John McNeil, to follow. I want to close by commending to all of you his moving essay, Irina's Lamp, which that appears in the December issue of Perspectives on History, in case you have not read it. That reflection on the meaning of a lamp he inherited from his great-great-grandmother, born a slave in Virginia in 1833, demonstrates to all members of the so association the distinct sensibility I have come to admire this past year. And now, please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Tyler Stovall to deliver his presidential address, White Freedom and the Lady of Liberty. Thank you, Mary Beth, for that wonderful introduction. Um, like a bunch of you, I have a cold, so I hope you'll bear with me, and if I'm sniffling and wiping my nose is something rather disgusting, I hope <laughs> you will forgive me. 
Um, it is a pleasure to be here. It is a great honor to have served this past year as president of the American Historical Association. In particular, it has been a wonderful privilege to have worked with all the people I've gotten to know during the course of these last two years. Um, let me point out, first of all, the staff, people like Dana Schaefer, Debbie Doyle, and um, Joe Gardella, and many others, and the members of the council, and both my, uh, my the president before me, Pat, Patrick um, uh, Manning. Manning, thank you, <laughs> Patrick Manning, and uh, the president after me. And um, in particular, it's been a great pleasure to work with Jim Grossman, the Energizer Bunny of the American Historical Association. If I had half his energy, I would be a happy man. <laughs> so what I want to do today is to talk about uh, what is a, a chapter out of a larger project I'm working on. The larger project is, is the study of the relationship between freedom and race in the modern world. And the basic argument is the idea that um, our ideas of freedom, as they have developed in the modern world, are racialized in many different respects. And I thought there was no better place to start than a study of the great uh, global icon of freedom, the Statue of Liberty. Now, I started out this project by investigating a certain rumor that was circulating about, starting about 20 years ago. And the rumor was that the Statue of Liberty that we currently know in New York Harbor is actually a fake. It, does, it is not real. It was replaced. The original Statue of Liberty was actually black. Let me see if I can move this. And that is a cartoon that was done to reflect that. By the way, the, the, the black Statue of Liberty is a real statue. It exists in Saint Martin in the French Caribbean. But starting about 20 years ago, there was all this uh, discussion in various blocks that this was the real Statue of Liberty, that when it came to the United States, the American government decided it was not acceptable, acceptable to have a black Statue of Liberty, so they seized it and hid it and replaced it with a white copy. There are even people that believe that this original Statue of Liberty still exists somewhere in the catacombs of New York. <laughs> so. <laughs> Now, there is no evidence to support that theory. <laughs> Nobody has ever found it in the catacombs of New York. Uh, but nonetheless, I thought that was an interesting idea. And the, the, the thesis went a bit farther. It said that the point of the Statue of Liberty was not to celebrate immigration, which has often been seen in the present day, but rather to celebrate the end of slavery in the United States, and particularly to mem memorialize black Union soldiers and their contribution to the victory in the Civil War. So I thought it'd be interesting to start from there and try and entangle what has been the racial meaning of the Statue of Liberty. So my purpose here is to explore the Statue of Liberty as a racial symbol, and especially as a symbol of whiteness and the link between whiteness and freedom. And I set out to make this uh, a transnational project because the, the point of the Statue of Liberty is, of course, it was a gift from France to the United States, and it f reflects discourses of freedom and of race in both countries. Uh, there are many different countries you could look at in this history, but both France and the United States, perhaps more than other nations in the world, really have centered their core national identities around the idea of being free countries, countries of free men, and to a certain extent perhaps, although not always, women. So uh, it seemed to me these two countries were especially important. These are also, of course, the countries I know. But these are especially important in terms of looking at what was the relationship between race and freedom, and of course they shared a common history of the Statue of Liberty. Now let me go uh, back and talk about my outline here. I want to look at, uh, first of all, of, uh, at the domestication of Republican freedom in France, how the idea of Republicanism uh, generated new ideas and more conservative ideas of freedom. Then I want to look at Republicanism and race in the United States. Then, uh, then I want to do a, a brief gender analysis of the Statue of Liberty. As a lot of feminist historians have pointed out, women are often used as the model of freedom without actually in any way that being intended to actually grant real freedom to women. So I wanted to look at that. And then finally look at the whole question of what is the relationship between the Statue of Liberty and our views of immigration and how they've changed over time in the United States. Now, the Statue of Liberty was built in France, an expression of the centrality of France to the French nation, 
and of France, and especially of the centrality of uh, freedom to the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and note liberté comes first. Under the French Revolution and since, freedom has been linked to the idea of republicanism, emphasizing popular sovereignty, individual liberty, and ultimately, although not initially, political democracy. Now, the Statue of Liberty was created during the apprenticeship of the Republic in France, which was a very long apprenticeship. Uh, you could say that it really began in, under the French Revolution and went all the way to the establishment of the Third Republic in 1870. During those many decades, France experienced, experimented, experimented with a number of different kinds of regimes, republics, empires, uh, and before finally settling down on the idea of the liberal republic as the main matrix of freedom. Throughout this history, there was a core, te core tension between uh, liberalism and liberal uh, republicanism and radical republicanism, or between mass democracy and individual freedom. In the current day, we are so used to thinking of liberal democracy as a united entity, as a, th as a thing, that is often easy to forget that in many ways the idea of liberal democracy combines two very opposed principles, one emphasizing the rights of the individual, one emphasizing the powers of the collectivity. And so this was the kind of ideological struggle that went on in France, which would by the, by, by the 20th century be resolved in the form of liberal democracy. Ultimately, a liberal vision of freedom triumphed over the radical vision. Uh, which went by very, various many names in France, like the idea of the République sociale, for example, the social republic. And there are specific dates in French history that show that triumph. The Ninth of Thermidor in the French Revolution, for example, the, suppression, the June days and the suppression of the radical republic in 1848, and most importantly, the Paris Commune. The Statue of Liberty was being built during this period, uh, a period of the definition of what the revolutionary heritage was supposed to be. Now this is the classic uh, ideal, classic visual representation of the idea of the radical republic. It's Eugène Delacroix's 1830 painting, Liberty, Liberty Leading the People, which in many ways was the model for the Statue of Liberty. And I'll go over a bit more in detail how this differs from the Statue of Liberty, but uh, note that it does. Note that this is a, person, a woman who is armed, uh, who is carrying uh, the Phrygian cap, the symbol of the freed slave, and is very much militant, and is also a figure in motion, as opposed to the Statue of Liberty that is very much standing still on her pedestal. Another image of radical freedom was the, the so-called the communarda petroleuse, the, the female incendiary during the Paris Commune. This is from a very popular graphic novel in France today, but also carried an image of woman representing radical freedom. And here you have another image of the petroleuse. The point about the petroleuse was she was seen as monstrous, as very dangerous. She is also carrying a flame, a flame to burn the enemies of the Republic. And as you saw in the previous image, petroleuse female incendiary means that these are women who went out around and set fires throughout Paris. Now, this was a myth. Nobody ever came across any actual examples of petroleuse. The fact that it was a myth and a very powerful one, hundreds of women were executed, often because they were carrying empty milk bottles, which people figured might be gas bombs, uh, speaks to both the importance of the image of liberty and the fears of the image of liberty. So these two concepts of liberty were battling it out. Uh, ultimately, um, throughout the 19th century, and especially during the Paris Commune. Now, in developing the idea of the Statue of Liberty, this is the work above all of the, 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 the writer Edouard de Laboulaye, um, who came up with the idea in the late 1860s, early 1870s. Laboulaye was a convinced liberal, an admirer of the United States as a moderate republic, a republic that gave pride of place to property and property owners, and yet emphasized liberty and liberalism. His one major objection to America in the 1860s was uh, the fact that it was a slave republic. 
He commented at one point, why is it that this friendship between France and America has cooled? This is writing in 1862. Uh, why is it that the name of the Americans is not so dear to us as it was in those days? It is due to slavery. So once a couple of changes happened, once uh, America liberated the slaves, thanks to the Emancipation Proclamation, and once the Second Empire collapsed in France, one happening in 1863 to 1865, the other happening in 1870. He believed that then the time had come to create a statue that would emphasize the common adherence of both nations, both liberal nations, to the idea of freedom. That because America was no longer a slave republic, it made sense to have this kind of statue. Now, and I'll get to this in a moment, ultimately what you had was a decidedly conservative vision of the Republic, and, if, and in fact, a conservative vision of what was the, the revolutionary heritage of Marianne. Now, part of the history of Marianne, what it was linked not only to revolution, but also to the metaphor of the, of the rebel slave, of the slave as revolutionary. And there were especially symbols like, which were common throughout representations of Marianne, the Phrygian cap, the cap worn by freed Roman slaves, and also the idea of broken chains, a woman who was carrying broken chains. Um, and you can see, you can't really see them there, but you can see, certainly see the Phrygian cap. So the image of liberty harked back to the idea of liberty as the, opposition of, uh, op, uh, as the opposite of slavery, and the liberated person, the liberated woman, as a freed slave. This was not so tenable in the design that went forth for the Statue of Liberty in the United States. Uh, when Laboulaye uh, traveled to the United States in the early 1870s, it became clear to him that creating a statue as a symbol of slave emancipation in the United States that was rapidly moving away from radical republicanism itself was not going to be viable politically. So, instead of the Phrygian cap, let me go back to the original, whoops. You had, a, you had a crown emphasizing enlightenment. The metaphor of the rebel slave was no longer there. The Statue of Liberty does, in fact, have chains at its feet, but you can't see them because of the pedestal that it's on. So the major symbols of liberty as the antithesis of slavery disappeared in the Statue of Liberty as it was built by the 1880s. Now this is fascinating in broader perspective because what you have is the statue that becomes the great symbol of uh, freedom in the United States, indeed in the world, has nothing to say about what is in many ways arguably the greatest struggle for freedom in the United States, the struggle against slavery. That aspect of its history, that aspect of American history was very much a face, even though, of course, these things were happening at the same time. Now, uh, finally, I want to make the point that um, the new conservative vision of the Republic in France after 1870 had an important racial and imperial dimension. One of the, 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 uh, the contradictions and the, the sort of most strange aspects of the rise of the Third Republic in France, which is France's longest republic going from 1870 to 1940, was the fact that it was a republic that presided over the nation's greatest experial expansion in its history. So you had the contradiction of a republic ruling an empire, or um, a nation of citizens ruling over an empire of subjects and colonial subjects. And the fact that you had this transition in the Statue of Liberty reflects this uh, sort of dichotomy. On the one hand, a rejection, uh, an embrace on liberty, but on the other hand, a rejection of the idea that liberty could truly be part of the heritage of all women and men. Now, this racial dimension, which is present in France, becomes much more uh, salient in the United States once the statue comes to the United, once the statue comes to America. The statue is stripped of any references to the Civil War, of any references to the struggle against slavery, and becomes a representation, representation of not just freedom but ultimately white freedom. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, 
It is important to, it is important to emphasize that the United States, that the Statue of Liberty is being erected during the whole period of Reconstruction and the, and the end of Radical Reconstruction. And it becomes an important metaphor for the failure of that movement. So it becomes one of the greatest symbols of uh, freedom, but of a symbol of freedom that ignores uh, a very important freedom struggle. Now, I want to move on to talk about gender and the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is seen as a woman in power, but also a woman controlled. Uh, a woman who is very dominant, he's huge, gigantic, majestic, but also a woman who does not move. A woman who, as one cultural commentator transiently noted, for a fee can be entered by anybody. <laughs> uh, and so it is a very paradoxical image of female empowerment that in many ways speaks to these kinds of ideals. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is built during the period of the rise of the, whole, the classical idea of bourgeois domesticity. Uh, it is prized, venerated, fixed in place, and really uh, refers to an image of female pro propriety. In 1887, for example, uh, Senator George Vest of Mississippi said, uh, in a speech opposing women's suffrage, said, it is said that suffrage is to be given to enlarge the sphere of women's influence. Mr. President, it would destroy her influence. It would take her down from that pedestal where she is today, influencing as a mother the minds of her offspring, influencing by her gentle and kindly caress the action of her husband toward the good and pure. And you can find lots of other citations about the proper role of women in, pub in the pub public sphere, or not the public sphere, in, in America at the time. And so this is what the Statue of Liberty represents, a woman who is gigantic, but also a woman who has lost uh, agency and is basically a symbol more than a live person. Part of the emphasis on the woman as being on a pedestal is really the image of the white woman on a pedestal. The white woman being protected against uh, aggressions by men of color and people, uh, men in general. So you have this image of the, the, the Statue of Liberty as somebody who's being protected against uh, challenges, uh, protected against, held in place, but protected against uh, challenges by different lowlifes in American society. Uh, there's one very interesting aspect of this, where you had in 1906, during a period of basically lynchings in the Ozark Mountains, Ozark Mountain re region of Missouri, a lynching that took place where three African men were lynched as a result of being accused of attacking a white woman. They were lynched um, at the base of a tower, at the top of which stood um, a representation of the Statue of Liberty. And so this was the cartoon that was produced in a local newspaper talking about, oh Liberty, what crimes are committed in thy name? Now it's interesting that there was a universal horror at this image that, pro that was provoked by the cartoon. People felt that the image of Liberty had been defiled, that the idea of liberty as lynching people was simply not acceptable. And yet what I would like to argue is that there's ways in which this whole ideal fits into a broader narrative of the role of uh, liberty in sort of, uh, in racial politics in the United States. So, um, liberty didn't literally lynch black men, but there was an idea that in effect, it could have that, play that role. Now, I want to move on to talking about immigration and the Statue of Liberty, because if you talk to most school children about the Statue of Liberty, what they will say is probably the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of immigration, is a, a statue welcoming immigrants to the United States and welcoming and creating the idea that the entire world is welcome in American shores. As a number of historians have pointed out, there were powerful forces in American society, society at the end of the 19th century 
that argued very much against this, that felt that the, the Statue of Liberty was actually a statue uh, symbolizing opposition to immigration or a nativist symbol. The movement that was led by Henry Cabot Lodge, Senator Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts in the early 20th century, and that ultimately triumphed with the 1924 restrictions on immigration, produced lots of images like this one, basically showing the Statue of Liberty being, being overwhelmed by uh, dirty immigrants. The Statue of Liberty standing for the purity of the American race as opposed to those who sought to threaten it. Um, and here's another image of that. There's also political, this, uh, sorry about the quality of the photograph. This is a man named European anarchist. So there's also a political dimension to this fear, which has a long, long history in the United States. So there were lots of uh, arguments that the Statue of Liberty actually was a symbol rejecting immigration. And I want to read a couple of quotes that shows uh, this opposition between these two. One is a classic quote of an em immigrant coming to the United States, and it says, to the immigrants who battled tough time in rough seas, the Statue of Liberty was a welcoming beacon, a mystical Madonna who made the homeless newcomers weep, pray, and dance for joy. Swathed in a morning's mist, the mesmerizing lady of the harbor appeared off to the left of their ships, hailing their entry to the new world. For many, it was the first time they dared to hope. The people were screaming, and some of them were crying. It was a, all kind of a joyous feeling of coming to the land of freedom and a land of love, recalled Clara Larson of New York City, who came from Russia in 1911. So that's one idea. On the other hand, you had a poem uh, written by Thomas Bailey Aldridge in 19, 1895 called Unguarded Gates, which summed up the nativist fear of immigration. Wide open and unguarded stand our gates and through them presses a wild motley throng. Men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Huang Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn. These bringing with them unknown gods and rites, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws. In street and alley, what strange tongues are loud? Accents of menace alien to our air. Voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. O oh, liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? On thy breast fold sorrow's children, soothe. So you have two very different images of the Statue of Liberty, one welcoming new Americans, one defending the United States against people who in many ways it is felt could never be Americans. So the question is, how do you get from this image of the white goddess to a statue that was seen as welcoming immigrants. And not just welcoming immigrants, but seeing America as a nation of immigrants, uh, even if they came from places beyond Britain and Germany that were often seen as suspect. Well, part of it, of course, was the work of the immigrants themselves, who tirelessly advocated for not just their role in society, but more in particular, the role of the Statue of Liberty as welcoming them to society. It was Joseph Pulitzer, for example, himself an immigrant from Germany that created the campaign to raise funds that eventually enabled the building of the, the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. And as these immigrants matured, and as they settled into America, and particularly as they had American children, they began to emphasize the, the importance of their role, that their role played in the creation of the United States. Another example was the First World War, in which the Statue of Liberty became, more than ever before, a great symbol of not just immigration, but of the nation as a whole. And here's a 1970 uh, poster uh, for war bonds that it particularly specifically appeals to the idea of the Statue of Liberty as a symbol of America. Another example, one of my favorite images of the Statue of Liberty, was this living statue of 18,000 soldiers uh, formed in Kansas in 1918. And you can see if you look closely, there's the individual soldiers. And it was meant to symbolize the United States as a nation of immigrants, but also, in particular, as a nation of freedom. Now, nothing more famously symbolizes the idea of the statue as mother of exiles than the famous poem by Emma Lazarus, The New Colossus. Lazarus herself came from a well-established German-Jewish family um, in New York 
and her, by her early 30s had carved out a substantial reputation as a poet. She was the one who crafted uh, the new Colossus, uh, which became the great literary symbol of the Statue of Liberty. Um, now, it's important to note that the new Colossus received little attention at the time and played no role in the formal inauguration of the Statue of Liberty in 1886. As the historian Esther Shore, the biographer, biographer of Emma Lazarus, has argued, and in fact, many ways, the poem, The New Colossus, was not widely associated with the Statue of Liberty until the 1930s. And it was not associated with the idea of unrestricted immigration until a new period of uh, um, massive flight from Europe. So it reflects not so much the 1890s, but the 1930s. Now, it's in these years, the interwar years in the world, years of the Second World War, that the, there comes a new sort of embrace of the idea of immigration. People are, are familiar with the trope of, for example, World War II uh, bomber pilot movies, where there's a whole panoply of different members from different ethnic groups. Or there is this cartoon in 1941, the Detroit Free Press, which shows um, the Statue of Liberty embracing all these people from different countries and calling them my children. It is important to note that they're all from European countries. Uh, so it is also an embrace of whiteness at the same time. By the 1970s and the 1980s, America's organizing the, the centennial of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and it becomes, the centennial becomes a great celebration of America as an immigrant nation, often by, um, by the Reagan administration and by conservative forces in American society in general. People of color are also largely excluded from this celebration. But one of the points I want to make, and it's going to be one of my final points, is that there's a sense in which the Statue of Liberty never really celebrated immigrants. It only started to become popular at a time when the number of immigrants in American society was declining drastically in the 1920s and 1930s. What it celebrated was people like Lee Iacocca, the descendants of immigrants, the Americanized descendants of immigrants, or you could say the white descendants of immigrants. So um, throughout, it, remained a, it retained a very complex relationship with the idea of immigration. Some commentators on the celebrations in the 1980s noted that these celebrations took place during a period when the United States was debating new restrictions on immigration, calling, calling into question the symbolism of the statue as the mother of exiles. Uh, but it's important to emphasize the sort of limits of the celebration. The centennial apotheosis, apotheosis of the Statue of Liberty took place in a time when most immigrants were coming from Asia and Latin America, not Europe. The statue saluted those of European immigrant background who had achieved whiteness in America, while at the same time turning a cold shoulder to those who had not. No one proposed building similar statues on the US-Mexican border, in Miami, or in Angel Island in San Francisco. And certainly, no one proposed building such a statue in Charleston, South Carolina, or for that matter, in New York itself. And one of the things that the, New York, the Statue of Liberty does in New York Harbor is obscures the fact that New York was also a major slave port. Um, so it would be interesting at some point to see two statues in New York Harbor, one celebrating immigration and one celebrating the rise of uh, the, the forced immigration of slaves. It would be more historically accurate. So let me just conclude with a couple of, of arguments. The idea of freedom in America is symbolized more than anything by the Statue of Liberty. In many different contexts, from the French struggle for republicanism to American debates about immigration, it has stood for human liberty and prosperity. Standing in New York Harbor at the gateway to the United States from Europe, it has, be, it has become the quintessential representation of American national identity, while equally exemplifying America's trans, transnational and global presence. The Statue of Liberty has been instrumental in underscoring the belief that liberty is the essence of America's national life, as well as its promise to all the peoples of the world. In this talk, I have argued that this promise is shaped by race and racial difference. The Statue of Liberty throughout its history has represented a white vision of freedom, one shaped by development in France, developments in France, the United States, and elsewhere. In France, Labelle's vision of the statue emphasized the rejection of revolutionary politics in favor of a moderate republicanism 
that largely excluded a racialized working class and embraced an imperial vision of the nation state that created a massive new colonial empire structured by racial difference. In the United States, the statue's roots in anti-slavery were largely hidden, and it became a symbol of European immigration once and only once. The descendants of those immigrants had won acceptance as white Americans. In both countries, the very idea of freedom had a racial component, one that helped shape most, its most monumental representation. In a sense, the Statue of Liberty, the, wor the world's most famous immigrant in modern history, its, its cold European facial features were no ac accident, expressing instead the racial aesthetics and politics of liberty in the modern world. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler, for persevering through that cold, giving such a wonderful talk. So the 132nd Presidential Address of the American Historical Association is now adjourned, and you're invited to join us two doors down the hallway, which goes that way, in Salon 1 for a reception, which is sponsored by the History Channel in Tyler's honor. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.